Good evening and welcome to our History, Theology, Philosophy lecture group. Um, we're very excited to have you here and joining us tonight for our topic, uh, Pagan Vikings versus the Christians. Um, our History, Theology, and Philosophy group um, it has been an in-person group right now during the pandemic. We're only doing live stream, but nearly every Tuesday we talk about meaningful topics within that kind of uh, broader uh, range of, uh, you know, and that's a fairly broad side of the humanities here, but in, with the idea that what we're talking about also can be relevant to living a meaningful life in this day and age. My name is John Hamer. Uh, my background is as a medieval historian uh, and also in publishing and map making, professional illustrator. And I also serve as pastor of uh, the Downtown Community of Christ congregation here in the city. We always start uh, our broadcast with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. Um, so our mission overall really is about building community together. And one of the things I feel that has been a problem in our society in the last, in my generation of the whole time I've been alive is the uh, dismantling of all of our local associations, our locally held institutions. Um, and as a result of that, uh, unraveling a lot of the fabric of our society at the personal level, um, which unfortunately has the effect, I think, of disenfranchising us. So I think it's very important, especially in these kind of times right now, when we're connecting mostly by uh, internet and online, that we re-weave uh, these connections um, through, again, local in initiatives like this, that nevertheless, because of the internet, can have a, a global outreach. And so I welcome you to building community with us together. Um, as always, of course, our um, all of our programs are, are listener supported, um, and we very much appreciate the donations that you've given us. And um, if you're been a person who's a longtime uh, listener and um, appreciates the content we produce, uh, we invite you at some point or other to go to our website, centerplace.ca. There's a big red button, support Centerplace. There's also a button in the Facebook if you're watching us on Facebook where you can uh, make a contribution. So thank you so much. Um, next week, kind of following up on this theme, we've been in the Middle Ages for a little while, and we're going to stay there for just a little while, at least one more week. And we're going to look at the history of the Crusades and also of medieval Islamic Jihad. And so we're going to look at the um, concept, uh, uh, philosophical concept of holy war as developed in the two um, larger Abrahamic religions uh, that fought holy wars against each other in the Middle Ages. And then we are also going to look a little bit about, you know, the history of how that all happened and played out and maybe some of the consequences or reverberations to um, our present day, you know, in the, again, the last uh, 20 years or so, especially um, this sort of uh, standoff between the West and uh, Islamists uh, who have a particular reading of the history. Our topic tonight uh, is a different uh, kind of warfare in the Middle Ages on the other side of the um, of the other side of Christendom from the uh, the Muslim wars is the warfare with the pagans uh, the, and specifically the Norse pagans the people from Scandinavia um, who were uh, actually uh, attacking and raiding uh, you know Christian lands around the same time that uh, Muslim raiders were doing the same. So we'll look at that. Okay, so Vikings are <laughs> have been a, a very popular thing in pop culture, and they continue to be um, popular. Uh, there's uh, ideas and tropes that we have about them, everything from the helmets with the big horns and and every other thing, and uh, and it, so it also inspires you know pop cultural movies and television shows. There's a popular TV show on. I, I'm going to use scare quotes to call it the History Channel, <laughs> um, you know, that has been running since 
since 2013. Um, and unfortunately, like so much on the History Channel, there's not a lot that this show gets right about history. And so I've watched it a little bit and, and then it gets me mad and I have to stop watching it. But anyway, the, um, I want to talk just a little bit about some of the problems in our modern conceptions that we have of Vikings and, and how those diverge from kind of actual history. And it specifically, it especially plays out in this show and other places in our um, our sort of misperceptions of paganism and also of medieval Christianity. So uh, I think in the show Vikings, um, the, the show has what I think are frankly bizarre ideas about uh, paganism as a religion. So it's thinking of paganism as a big, large, unified religion. Um, and so King Eckbert of Wessex, so the Christian kingdom, the Christian Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex that ultimately um, is the nucleus for what becomes the king, kingdom of England. He spends all this time uh, in a bath because of his um, understanding of the Roman past and he's trying to emulate what it was to be an ancient Roman and we see in the show he collects all of these Roman relics and all of these texts and um, and he has says that you know in terms of all these Roman relics that he's in, encountering around England he, that his people think that giants built the ruins but he knows the truth it was pagans who built them so the Roman Empire, when at the time period when it was pagan, he wants to recover that kind of Roman greatness through paganism um, in the show. And so, um, nevertheless, that's a very strange, I mean, it's a very strange equation here. Let me just explain why. So also on the show, Eckbert says he's actually been to the continent. He's been to uh, Francia, to the uh, imperial court of Charlemagne, who's the king of the Franks and the emperor of what we call the Holy Roman Empire. And yet, even though he's actually been there, according to the show, nevertheless, he equates the Roman Empire, when he's talking about the Roman Empire, with paganism as opposed to Charlemagne, who is actually the current contemporary Roman emperor, uh, who's obviously a Christian. And anyway, so Eckbert in this show, since the Vikings are pagans, he's very curious about their religion because he somehow equates that with the religion of Julius Caesar and, and Caesar Augustus, which he doesn't equate um, his contemporary Roman Empire with that time. So that is totally alien. <laughs> You can see where I can see where a modern person would have that all garbled up because they um, don't understand. Uh, anyway, they certainly don't understand the Middle Ages. But anyway, in the medieval times, especially in the early medieval times, like um, Eckbert is living in, uh, the medieval people didn't think that giants had built all those ruins. They knew the Romans had built the ruins. Um, they actually, though, understood that Christianity had been the Roman Empire's state religion. So after Constantine converted and ultimately uh, under Theodosius when it became the state religion of the Roman Empire and all of the medieval people in the Christian West saw themselves as heirs of Rome and indeed um, they really didn't ever even think that Rome the Roman Empire had fallen or anything. That's kind of a modern idea that we have said, wait, wait a second, this really, this really was an end at the end of uh, when the Germanic invasions happened. And so actually it, it isn't unusual for all of them at this time period to maintain baths whenever they could because that had continued to be um, a custom and also a sign of status and wealth uh, dating from Roman times. In a lot of cases they didn't have the um, uh, the infrastructure to be able to have great baths like the Romans had had, but in some cases where they were able to keep them working, they, they did. And so as a result, as I say, they considered Charlemagne to be the Roman emperor. We say Holy Roman Emperor now because we're making this big distinction, um, but uh, there was no such distinction made at the time. Charlemagne was emperor of Rome as far as everybody uh, in the time period or in the West, medieval West was concerned. And, and so I have in the slide here um, this amazing um, palace, uh, Palatine Chapel that Charlemagne built in Aachen, what's now Germany, 
Um, and this is designed to be his kind of personal new Rome, his imperial capital north of the Alps. He also owns Rome itself, and, and that's the capital down there. But anyway, he built this, and you can kind of see this is just an amazing um, example of architecture, especially for the early Middle Ages, some, building something of this size and structure and complexity uh, with the dome and uh, all the golden mosaics and every other thing. So here's the... Um, imperial palace at Aachen, essentially Charlemagne's um, attempt to say, look, I'm a Roman emperor and I'm proving it by doing the thing that the Romans did, which is building stuff. Um, and you can see kind of on the right of this diagram is the, uh, the imperial um, church and chapel that I showed the inside of a second ago. So it's this octagonal building, uh, dome structure with the cupola on top. And then uh, can see that it's connected by this royal tribunal and then it goes to the um, other side where there's a basilica that's modeled very much on um, this vast basilica that uh, that Con the emperor constantine who was a you know emperor of rome in the, uh, who converted to christianity who he built in trier what's now germany a large basilica which is to say the throne room where the where the imp emperor would hold court over there but you can also see off to the side there, uh, it says on there, it says Les Thermes Imperio, the baths. So he also built it there so that he would be able to construct Roman baths because, again, he's a Roman. <laughs> he's the emperor of Rome, and that's what Romans do. Um, that um, that chapel at Aachen is amazing. It's specifically modeled under, uh, on, uh, the chapel in San Vitale, which was built by Justinian, this Roman emperor, um, Christian Roman emperor in Ravenna, Italy, which was actually the final capital of the Western Empire. We were there, uh, was it just last year? It seems like uh, <laughs> time has stopped or whatever has gone on. But anyway, we were there and visited this. And so San Vitale, anyway, is, a direct, uh, is the church that was directly uh, copied by Charlemagne to build his imperial capital uh, in Germany. Okay. Likewise, you know, um, we talked about Eckbert pre preserving all these texts. Well, Latin texts were absolutely preserved by the church, and Charlemagne actually decreed that all his bishops should maintain schools to teach Latin. That actually, that uh, decree is what sets um, in motion, essentially, the entire revival of, of learning and schools, and ultimately becomes the origin of the university system, which is created by uh, the medieval Latin West. So um, clerics preserved then Roman texts, including those of pagan authors, which had long ago been absorbed into Christianity. So Viking paganism was not equated whatsoever with Roman culture or ancient Roman uh, culture. It, rather, it was equated with country folk magic and not the religion then of Caesar long dead. I'm going to show you this one more thing that happened on this show. We'll stop talking about it. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, at some point or other, um, a, a Saxon uh, bishop, so one of the Christian bishops in the Anglo-Saxon lands, um, takes uh, this um, recalcitrant uh, Christian priest who becomes a pagan, Athelstan, and they actually then crucifies him, which is insane. <laughs> uh, the idea that any medieval christian was crucifying anybody is crazy because that was not the thing that they were doing it's not that they didn't kill people but they were not not crucifying them so um there were all kinds of things that a christian might execute a person for and like it was like burning them at the stake drawing and quartering them hanging them you know cutting off your head if trees and all kinds of things like that they did not ever crucify anybody so anyway I'm, i'll stop um going off on this show <laughs> okay so let's talk instead about what we can um, actually know about Norse religion. So what do we know about the Scandinavian paganism, uh, which, like I say, nobody in Anglo-Saxon England or, um, or Frankish, uh, the Frankish Roman Empire uh, was equating with early, um, early uh, Roman paganism. Um, so how, it, pagan, how is paganism different from a world religion like Christianity, and so therefore a very different um, individualized thing instead of one giant thing. So what do we know about Norse religion during the Viking Age, which is essentially the late 700s to the mid 1000s? And also I want to look here tonight 
how did medieval Christianity respond to the Viking threat? And, and especially, how did they ultimately succeed at converting these Norse people? In a lot of ways, we might think um, this is a dark age. This is a, an age of warriors. The Vikings are warriors, certainly. So are the Anglo-Saxons. So are the Franks. They're not, they're all pretty, you know, kind of warlike people. And, uh, and in some ways, we think of Norse paganism as being a... Um, a religion of warrior gods, and we are probably fairly aware of this idea of Valhalla, where if you have an honorable death in combat, you know you're going to go to the, the hallowed drinking halls, and uh, and so in other words, it's a religion maybe that um, should uh, have you know like a lot of benefit for let's say a warrior ethos in a kind of a an age of fighting, and so why would then a religion that's about uh, a guy who says love your enemies and who himself gets crucified and who is in some way and then you know ha takes the title prince of peace you know how is that um and it ends up being a, a value added for a warrior people so to just set some context um just briefly we can't go into this whole history uh, this is a map um, of the christian roman empire in the fourth fifth six centuries so after the conversion of constantine and then later the whole empire to christianity the separation of the empire kind of in east and west the east uh, is essentially the purple the greek east the orange the latin west and we are seeing here with all of the little arrows are um, all of the um, germanic confederations that lived north of the frontier the danube and rhine frontiers um, who after a whole long series of crises and uh, plagues, depopulation, um, the population of the empire was low, the population north of was high, and when the Huns came in, uh, they essentially, it was nobody wanted to be around the Huns. <laughs> and, so, and so all of these Germans uh, penetrated into the empire and moved into the orange here west, the Latin west, uh, which ultimately then ceased to function in the, in the way the Roman state had before. Essentially, the, the Roman government and the Roman military um, were replaced by Germanic configura confederations and ultimately Germanic kings um, took the place of uh, the different Roman officials and Roman generals that had previously ruled these, these areas. And so then, by around the year 500 AD, you can see this a little more detailed map. It's hard to probably see on your screen, but you can see the pink area is again that Greek East. So what we start to call the Byzantine Empire, although it's still really just the Roman Empire, the East Roman Empire centered around the great city of Constantinople, which is inassailable and doesn't fall. Uh, whereas in the West, um, uh, we essentially have a, a series of uh, of barbarian, we kind of call them kingdoms, the kings of the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Burgundians, the Franks, uh, and of course the kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxons up in, up in Britain. And so essentially um, every one of these little kings in some ways recognizes that the emperor back in Constantinople is somehow really the ultimate source or font of sovereignty, and most of their um, most of the inhabitants of their lands are Roman, and lots of them still think of themselves as being part of the Roman world, but um, we change it in the maps because the reality is that they are all functionally autonomous and independent uh, uh, and under the essentially uh, royal governments of various Germanic confederations. And so, as we've mentioned here, you can kind of see it as we zoom in a little bit. The Regnum Francorum, that pink area, that's become the heartland of what becomes uh, Francia, the kingdom of the Franks. Charlemagne's empire um, it, it emerges out of that nucleus, and you can see the Angles and Saxons that are kind of moving in at this time period to Britain. So Roman civilization in the West, um, I've shown in a couple different lectures in, in greater depth, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, um, retreats I'd say into monasteries. So the church structure is maintained. The whole idea that there are, are bishops and dioceses. A diocese is just a, a Roman word for province <laughs> uh, and becomes a church word for province. Um, and you can also see um, in this plan here for this amazing um, 
monastery, one of these great uh, monasteries of the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, St. Gall in Switzerland, 9th century. Um, this plan is just very Roman. It has a Roman basilica. It has Roman, um, uh, everything about it is how Romans would have essentially made their kind of a paradise slash villa estate. And now it's, um, it's set apart for um, educated Latinate people, essentially Romans, monks, and nuns who um, withdraw from this kind of world of uh, chaos and uh, you know barbarian kingdoms and everything like that and instead turn inward where they preserve uh, Latin learning and contemplation and ultimately again their this sort of Roman philosophical theological devotion to Christianity. Um, so this is just a uh, example. Um, so when we look at these things, you, you may not, if you go and visit these monasteries that are still preserved all across Europe, um, you'll note at the, in the middle of it, there's this thing called a cloister, which is almost identical to if you had, if you had a Roman villa where a, um, a noble had their kind of country palace estate, they would have had a stoa, or, which is almost just like a cloister like this. Um, and so it's an outdoor garden where you can sit and rest and contemplate and you have the, the portico where you can be in shade and you can go out and, and, uh, and so on, the fountain in the middle. This is a, um, it becomes um, central to the idea of what it is to have a monastery and to be a monk or a nun, but it's simply taking a Roman form and preserving it and using it in a new, um, not even entirely new way. So one of the things that had happened in the later Roman Empire uh, is that the church became the state and the state and the church were totally wed. So after the emperor Theodosius made Christianity the Roman state religion in the 380s, church and state became one of the same. The bishops, including the Bishop of Rome and the Patriarch of Constantinople, were imperial officials who could not serve without the emperor's approval. Um, and that system especially conti continued in the Greek East, uh, what we call again the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, because there continued to be in Constantinople an emperor who had an army, and there continued to be um, a patriarch that the emperor appointed, uh, and they continued to work in that very same church-state close way under the authority of the empire. Um, it's a little different what happens in the West because there's, they, they lose emperors for a while. So the collapse of the imperial system in the West created separate spheres for church authority and state authority. Um, so the Germanic kings and their warrior bands, although Christian, they formed a separate caste, essentially, from the Roman churchmen who continued to run the bureaucracy of the state. So now we suddenly have kind of a, um, a separation between kind of two spheres of church and state that emerge in the West in a way that's quite original for the rest of well, most other places in the world. And so although church and state are still very intertwined, the idea that uh, religion has a very separate sphere from secular life, life, I think really originates then in this experience that is had in the Christian West uh, and when the barbarian kingdoms start to exist. Okay, so that's lots of hopefully understandable but fairly rapid paced um, backstory to get us to this time period when we have Charlemagne and also the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and so we're and, and immediately after Charlemagne, so the uh, the time period of the Viking Age. And so um, Charlemagne, uh, this great king of the West, unites most of um, Western Christendom, uh, the greatest empire then that has existed since Rome's fall um, in by around the year 800 when he's crowned emperor uh, by the Pope and revives uh, the claim to the Roman Empire and the title of Roman Emperor in the West. Um, at this point in the East, the East Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, has also fallen on some very hard times uh, as the um, Muslims have encroached and have conquered many of their most lucrative provinces, Egypt, Spain, and North Africa. And so um, you can kind of see this here. I'm going to zoom out. <laughs> Um, so one of the things you can kind of see has happened is um, the uh, Caliphate of Baghdad under the Abbasids um, has become a very um, powerful and also rich and also culturally um, uh, uh, vibrant area. And indeed, um, 
in some ways at this era, you know, really uh, in wealth and capacity, intellectual capacity and everything else is really eclipsing the little bit that's left of Christendom. Um, and so um, that has had a major effect on everybody's psyche and on what's left. But Charlemagne is sort of a, has sort of um, re brought together and revived everything that's left in the, in the Latin West, as you can kind of see here. So one of the things that has happened is that as there is this revived trade due to the wealth of the Abbasid Caliphate, um, trade networks uh, revive all around Europe. And part of that is uh, the trade networks that exist in the north uh, with the medieval Arab world now cause a general revival in the 8th and 9th century of European wealth and trade. In other words, so the, the existence in some ways of uh, Islam as a potential force for conquering Christendom is, is, an, is dangerous existentially, but the fact that it's wealthy and vibrant and doing a lot of trading with everybody um, actually jump starts what had been kind of a moribund uh, declining economy in the West, which turns things around in terms of population and everything else. But where it affects people especially right away is uh, including all these northern areas that um, are going to be where the Vikings come from. So. Um, in our kind of conception of Vikings that we have from the TVs, um, they're, bar they're barbarians. And, and certainly people at the time also thought of them as being barbarians, uh, the people in the Latin West. Um, there's a long established lens for that. Um, on TV, they're often portrayed as going uh, to battle like with their shirtless. Uh, so brawn over any kind of contemporary technology. It's just the fact that they're these hulking guys who were so big and violent. They're often showed in, in TV shows who's covered with all these tattoos and just scary and everything like that. We don't actually have any um, evidence that they're that they had tattoos like that at all. <laughs> so um, they don't have, there's no evidence really of them having the horned hats and that kind of thing that they wouldn't have there in general because those are, um, uh, if you're, hitting with a sword you can hit the helmet and the the horn will make the helmet come off and so it's not the kind of thing you want to have um, in point of fact actually uh, the Norse prized armor um, and so if they could get their hands on the armor they wanted to have it and in fact um, Charlemagne's heirs the kings of the Franks they continually had to prohibit the export of armor and swords uh, to the north and so you know you always th this is the kind of thing where you try to pre prevent your re perennial enemies from you know like exporting arms and weaponry and technology to them unfortunately they you know the the kings only had so much power as you know as far as the locals are concerned and so the the uh, various arms dealers never obeyed that and so they were always supplying uh, enemies with weapons and then that ended up helping the vikings in their raids um, but other thing we should point out in terms of the vikings as barbarians um, their raiding and trading was actually really possible because of some serious technological breakthroughs in shipbuilding uh, by the Norse that took place in the uh, 8th and 9th century. So they were able to perfect a kind of ship um, that had all kinds of uh, advantages uh, technologically over what had occurred before in this, their area especially, so the North Sea area. Um, so let's look a little bit of the naval technology. So in, in antiquity, Scandinavia in the Middle Ages was just heavily forested. So there's just very isolated communities that are connected only by water. So um, you just couldn't walk across Sweden and Norway. The only way you get across Norway is by boat. Uh, it's just all big, dense woods. And so millennia of experience in woodworking and shipbuilding and seafaring uh, was what was the result for all of the um, people living in those communities. And so one of the things they developed are very light, very flexible ships with very shallow drafts. They don't they don't have to be deep into the into the water, which allow not only for ocean travel but also river travel. Uh, and you know, being able to get up at the rivers, uh, you know, navigate very high up the rivers because your boat isn't sinking too deep in the river um, allows you to raid very far inland or trade very far inland. Um, so less necessary. They had harder conditions up there and this is one of the reasons why you know necessity is the mother of invention, right? So there's way less necessity in terms of the sailing conditions in the Mediterranean, which is far less rough 
um, uh, than the North Atlantic. And so, you know, they just had more need to invent up there. And so one of the things that happened as a result of their inventions is that their superior naval technology actually gave the North naval supremacy in the northern seas for a couple centuries anyway. Um, so again, sometimes we think of barbarians, you know, Conan the Barbarian or whatever, and they're just uh, doing this because of being really strong, <laughs> you know. But actually, um, uh, people who are in otherwise less economically sophisticated places can still make, in, in, in the antiquity in the Middle Ages, can still make a significant, let's say, military technology advance that will give them an edge over the more uh, static, larger, economically diverse agricultural societies that they end up using the technology to raid. So just to compare um, Norse versus Frankish society, so in comparison, uh, to the Franks and the Anglo-Saxon, the Franks in what's now France and Germany, the Anglo-Saxons in Britain, the Norse really lacked any cities or even large towns. Um, they were organized by clans and war chiefs, and sometimes they would call those war chiefs king, um, but they really lacked any of the kind of royal institutions to have a, a long and large um, uh, bureaucratic apparatus. So the king's um, would ha maybe because you're a very powerful and uh, war chief of renown, you might get huge number of people to come with you on a raid, uh, but your control over them when you get back home is almost non-existent and they might leave at any time. And so um, there's almost no control you would have over a kingdom. Um, and indeed it's not even territorial. It's like you're the king of so-and-so the Danes or something like that, but it's not so much that you're king of Denmark, a land that everybody on there is paying you taxes or something like that. Um, in general, uh, a much higher percentage of the population is under arms. Uh, and so in other words, people who are able to be called upon to get in a boat with an ax is a lot higher in um, Denmark than it's going to be in Francia, where um, the Franks, the majority of the population are going to be Roman Gallic serfs and peasants who are not going to be under arms. And it's just the small number of Franks who are um, the military class under those circumstances. Uh, and then finally, they, they totally lack the labor resources for monumental buildings. So there's almost nothing uh, in comparison to this um, throne room and that palace I showed you of Charlemagne. There's almost nothing from contemporary Scandinavia that um, is comparable that anybody would have built. Um, what they ended up having was a very asymmetric kind of warfare. So warfare between the Vikings and Christian kingdoms, um, you know, each side was doing something very different. Uh, the reality is that the resources at the disposal of the Frankish Empire of the West, I mean, if he was able to call all of his stuff together, which he, it took months and months and everything like that to do, um, that would just vast, vastly outweigh anything of any Viking leader. Um, nevertheless, uh, there's, you can see that there's a difference in speed, right? So the speed of the ships, you know, was just orders of magnitude faster than all medieval land travel. So the Vikings could just get someplace very, very fast. And so they could attack, plunder, and be gone before the message even got to the king, much less he could gather all of his vast numbers of men and then move a very slow moving army to repel the invasion again that might already be gone. I said I wasn't going to talk more about this Viking show. This, <laughs> but this is weird thing that happens. The first time the Vikings show up in England, like the Anglo-Saxons are able to just like they're waiting with an army on the shore for these guys to show up, and it's like no, they weren't, <laughs> you know, because you can't have an army everywhere in your entire vast land, you know. So their their army is somewhere, or actually, it's not really assembled at all. Uh, there will just be a small guard around the kings, and then they can assemble a vast army. Um, but when the Vikings first show up, especially at the beginning, and then nobody ever wasn't aware they were going to do this, um, they're able to raid fairly easily and with a lot of impunity because there's um, uh, there isn't anybody that is going to be immediately there. So asymmetric warfare. Um, the eventual response, though, of the Latin West, I mean, it took a long time to be able to react to all of this stuff. <laughs> Um, by the end of the Viking era, one of the responses technologically uh, and militarily is the development of the castle. So we think of the later Middle Ages, castles are one of the things we think of as being central to medieval warfare, and then also the knight. And so the knight of this very heavy cavalry and heavily armored cavalry. Um, 
the knight in with a heavy cavalry charge on infantry that could break a viking infantry shield wall and all those formations and so in some ways um, this thing that we kind of maybe think of as the central way of the um, military and also military infrastructure the castle um, so the castle the important thing of that is a viking Vikings can't get in castles. They don't. They don't have siege weapons and all this kind of thing. They they raided because um, the Latin West was largely just open to raids. You could go to one of those monasteries. You just go right up to it. And it's there's no troops there. It's just monks and all these gold crosses and stuff. And so they would just go up there. The monks don't fight back and uh, and they run away when they take they kill them or they don't. And they but they take all the stuff and they run away. Um, by the by the later by the end of the Viking period and the reason why the Viking period ends they're all surrounded by walls and castles and things like that and there's also um, you know, the West has developed knights that are able to um, you know have rapid response and fight against uh, um, these kind of raiders and indeed if you th if you um, think of the time period of uh, 1066 the the conquest of England by the Normans who are themselves descended from Vikings um, one of the things that the Anglo-Saxon king at the time, King Harold, had was this very um, powerful rapid response guard that had just earlier that year, the same year, 1066, of, of uh, one of the last great Viking kings had attacked in the north of England to try to take over England. And his rapid response guys had ran all the way up there, had fought him off and killed him. And then they'd run all the way back from the north of England down to the very south of England in order to fight the Normans. And so they had a much more sophisticated um, uh, rapid response army than had ever existed before. Okay, but before they did all that, you know, so before they came up with the solution of knights and the castles and everything like that, you know, the Vikings were doing stuff like they conquered the kingdom of East Anglia in Britain and Northumbria in Britain and Mercia ultimately. So in other words, they conquered the whole kind of northeastern half of England in the 850s and 860s. They sacked Paris <laughs> and they conquered Normandy. Um, what's now called Normandy because it's the land of the Normans, which is to say the Norsemen, the Vikings. Um, and so um, already then by 820, Charlemagne's son, Emperor Louis the Pious, um, he tried to come up, okay, let's, we gotta have a different scheme here to stop these attacks. They're, this is killing us and it's too hard to respond to this. And so one of the things Louis the Pious has in his head is, wait a second, what if we could convert these guys? <laughs> and so he um, builds on his father, Charlemagne's, um, forced uh, conversion of the Saxons in Germany. So the Saxons, uh, when the northern part of Germany had been the last kind of pagan holdouts among the Germans, um, Charlemagne fought just brutal war after brutal war with them and essentially converted them by the sword. Uh, Louis hoped that maybe, let's okay, let's convert the Norse uh, and that might end the Viking raids the same way that the Saxons, you know, had already become um, a vital part of the Frankish Empire. So he took one, of, went to one of these Saxons, uh, who, in other words, people who were living close to Denmark, and he went to a Saxon churchman named Ansgar, uh, and a royal delegation was then set, sent to Jutland in, in what's now Denmark to begin a mission of converting the Norsemen. And so Ansgar and a team of monks went to the town of Hedeby, uh, uh, which is right on the border, essentially, between the Frankish Saxon realms and, and, and the Norse realms of Jutland, and what's now kind of Denmark. Uh, and so he traveled with, uh, went there with an exiled Danish king named Harald Clack, who had converted to Christianity at the Frankish court. And so they tried to... Um, uh, start you know a Christian mission, but they were kicked out after about two years, so it didn't really go very well. This um, initial missionary effort. Next steps. So that doesn't stop Ansgar. Ansgar, he's got a new idea. So he bought two uh, Norse slave boys, so uh, boys who spoke the language, and he hoped to then teach them Latin, and so he would raise them to be future missionaries. So they would already natively know the Norse language so that he would be better at being able to convert these guys. And so in 829, he went on another mission in response to an invitation by a Swedish king named Bjorn at Haugi. And so in 831, he became Archbishop of Hamburg and that then gave him a mission for future mission work, a base. Okay. 
Given the clear, though, and ongoing successes uh, by pagan Vikings against Christian kingdoms, Ansgar's task of getting Norsemen to abandon their ancestral gods and to adopt the new god of the Christians, you know, is is like kind of like, okay, how, how do I get them to do that if they're already kind of seem like they're, their gods actually giving victory, right? So I want to look at what the Norse religion actually entailed um, so we can see what Ansgar was up against. So we have to always, when we're dealing with this and trying to reconstruct things, we have to deal with the nature of the sources. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a lot of writings from uh, the Viking times because, from the Vikings themselves, because although the Norse possessed an alphabet, runic, and you might have seen um, rune stones and runic, especially if you're a fan of Tolkien, which use these in the um, in the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Uh, anyway, this idea though, runics. So these are based on an old Italic script related to ancient Etruscan, if you can imagine, um, that they'd had for a whole long time in the Norse lands, but they didn't use them for writing books really. They used them uh, for religious purposes, for what we might think of as magic, magic spells and, and enchantments and things like that, not for making books. And so the sad thing there is that we don't have any, any books from their perspective. Um, uh, so therefore, unfortunately, all of the descriptions come from enemies, uh, which is to say Christian observers and in some cases Muslim observers who are interacting with um, pagan uh, Vikings. Uh, we do have later sagas and histories that are written by Scandinavians. Those are all written later um, after everybody's converted to Christianity. And so it's by their Christian descendants who are somewhat sympathetic to their ancestors, but on the other hand, obviously they're tainted in a way as a source is by um, their new loyalties religiously, right? So um, the Norse religion is a variation and a development of the overall Germanic religion. Um, Norse religion included reverence for gods that were shared among ancient dramatic peoples. Um, and so if we think in English here of our days of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, these are named for Anglo-Saxon gods. When the Anglo-Saxons first got to England, they were pagans. They were converted by this time by the Viking Age. They become Christians. Um, but the names then, um, you know, Tyr, Woden for Wednesday, Tyr for Tuesday, uh, Thunor, Thor for Thor's Day, Thursday, and Freya, Frigg for Friday. So um, in the course of all this, um, between uh, the Germanic times, um, when maybe Tyr might have been the, uh, and Thor were maybe the more um, central gods, Odin had become in the, in the Norse religion by the time of the sagas uh, as the chief of the pantheon. Um, and so we have a little bit of idea of who the gods were and their pantheon. Due to the climate um, up in Scandinavia, obviously much time was spent in great halls. Uh, so these are the halls of the kings and the jarls or earls, we maybe think of that word, um, who, uh, which they themselves uh, religious, uh, they were other, there would also have themselves a religious site often built around or in the adjoining trees um, next to the great hall here. The great hall is sort of like a boat that's upside down as they're inside that and, um, having their uh, singing the sagas and, and having their um, banquets and so on and just actually just making it through the winter and making all the different things they would need. So Odin, in addition to um, being a god of royalty, of death, of healing and sorcery, he's also a god of poetry and you can imagine spending a lot of time in the winter in, in, in this, that poetry is important and oral poets then fashioned stories sort of like jazz musicians do which is you're telling a story that everybody knows but you're always riffing on things you're adding things um, the conclusion of the tales are going to be known and the audience though is going to be entertained by what details or digressions that you might add and so that's kind of how oral composition and oral uh, tradition kind of work you have the same idea that is slowly evolving some of the ideas everybody knows you wouldn't change stories too much but you would always want to be adding creative elements some of the components, when we think of like, how does the universe fit together according to the Norse uh, religion, the cosmology. So trees, they're in this very forested zone. The tree is this thing. If you go in your landscape, a tree is a thing that is connecting you on the ground level with the underworld and you have the roots, and then it's also going up into the sky. And so the tree is this, um, 
cosmologically. And so the cosmos for the Norse is uh, envisioned as Yggdrasil, the world tree. Um, there are within the cosmos or universe nine realms. Uh, the gods inhabit, uh, for example, realm of Asgard, and the humans live in Midgard, Middle Earth, as we say in the in the Lord of the Rings. Um, so the gods then are have been in a cosmic battle with the Jotnar, the giants, and uh, their war will eventually lead to Ragnarok, as we've heard. You know the great fatalistic end of the world when the world will be destroyed. Um, Nevertheless, even though we might have some, of, you might have some familiarity with what I just said, this kind of thumbnail sketch of uh, a Norse pantheon and Norse mythology, paganism is actually a lot more than mythology. Um, we tend to think of it that way and equate it that way because of our um, Abrahamic lens where Christianity is really focused on the Bible, Islam on the Quran. Uh, and so the texts or the myths seem like that's the important thing of paganism, but in a lot of ways, it's actually not the important thing or the most important thing. So in the same way that the barbarian aspect of Vikings is romanticized, I'm also going to think, I think that actually pagan religion is regularly romanticized. Uh, and so I think a lot of times people who are in a kind of a post-Victorian, post-1950s uh, idea of traditional Christian and other religions, which tend to be very puritan and very uh opposed to drinking and sex and all these kind of things so that's their major focus um, there's an idea that a pagan religion is is about hanging out in a hall getting drunk listening to sagas not feeling guilty about having sex or killing people and so it seems very um let's say tempting and licentious and things like that uh, but actually um the actual practice of paganism um, encompassed all aspects of a person's life um, in ways that you would find just amazingly crippling, amazingly, um, you know, you just can't imagine all of the different structures and things and uh, strictures and all the little uh, uh, rituals that you'd have to continuously do for, um, you know, getting on the God's good sides again, all of the, um, all of the different ways you'll have to um, frankly do things that are uncomfortable, self-mortifying and every other thing in order to um, live this uh, very all-encompassing and sometimes some ways individually oppressive religion. So the whole component of this uh, kind of a religion is uh, ritual and obligation for every activity that you might do in your life. So pagans believe that spiritual supernatural forces and beings were ever present and frankly, potentially hostile. And so therefore great care had to be taken to perform ritual activities, such as offering sacrifices, wearing amulets, per performing traditional rituals. Um, oops, what was that? Did that go? Are we still? Um, the, uh, there was also a need though to I understand, so like if you're having all these things that are going bad in your life, it's probably because you've been cursed or some, some God has, um, has ill-fated you in some way or some human has put a curse on you or something like that so you have to use divination in order to determine the origin of these curses you have to um, find out how to dispel them what amazing number of things that you have to go through in order to um, you know change your fate change your luck and and actually be um, restored to the good favors um, there's a lot that is involved in this more than like i just say anyway hanging out drinking and being licentious. Um, so there's a, an account, I said that some of the, the ways that we can actually access what was actually going on is through observers who could write. And so um, some of those include Muslim observers. And so Ibn Fadlan, who's a merchant, um, uh, an Arab who is traveling in what's later, what's now Russia uh, kind of area. He has an account of a Viking funeral. He's a 10th century Arab describing it. He talk, talks about how the dead chieftain was buried in a ship, and this is accompanied by just days and days of ritual sacrifices, including the sacrifice uh, to horses, a hen, a cock, slave woman, so human sacrifice. The ship is then uh, burned, and a uh, barrow is raised. And so this is a kind of a an intense ritual society that includes, um, anyway, a lot of effort in order to uh, be, for example, uh, 
have a, an, a reasonable afterlife to get to Valhalla. It's not just a matter of this one, um, you know, honorable death in battle. Um, so, for example, because if you don't do these rituals, if your funeral isn't done correctly, some ritual is done improperly, uh, if you uh, f uh, if people fail to return to that bar barrow to venerate the ancestors, then it would be believed that their ghosts or whites uh, would rise forth to menace the living. There were similar rituals for birth, marriages, every other life event, and which would require days and days to reform. So I'm not trying to say this is a bad religion. What I'm saying is that we tend to don't see, that tends to not get all portrayed. All of these other things that um, you'd have to be doing every day in order to not every day, just in everything you do, these rituals that you have to do in order to um, uh, appease the gods and the spirits and every other other thing. There is, in fact, no um, separate secular sphere. So the separation um, that we talked about starting to develop in terms of between church and state, um, uh, these are totally commingled in Norse paganism. There are special seeresses, vulver and sorcerers of both genders. So they did exist. So people, um, old ladies or old men, who would go off and um, be very focused on uh, particular kinds of the religious or magical rituals. Um, in general, though, Norse religion lacked clergy, and so they don't have like the Druids among the Celts, the Celtic uh, religion. Um, instead, each clan leader, the Jarl, the King, these are also religious leaders, and so they would be the ones that would offer the sacrifice. Um, the elders among those clans would offer religious opinions about the law or what needs to be done. Um, so pagan religion is very much completely intertwined with all aspects of life. Okay, so we've talked to them about what that was all kind of like, um, what it was Christianity like, or what, what does Christianity have going for it that allowed it to, um, to pull out ahead. So even though the Vikings were actually having all these victories that are won, you know, because they sacrificed to their gods and they won, right? So it seems like it's really working. Um, so given the all-encompassing nature of Norse religion and its antiquity, given the fact that the Jarls and kings had the religious power, why would they want to give up the power and give the religious power to Christian bishops? That doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense, right? It seems like if they were holding on to all of those things, they had all the power in their own hands. Um, so <laughs> there's a couple reasons, though. And so why did the Christians win? So the Norse, um, you know, in Hedeby, you know, those when... They wouldn't have been too impressed when Ansgar and his slave boy show up as missionaries, as one um, poor Saxon monk bishop or whatever, and a couple, you know, his uh, not very impressive retinue. <laughs> um, why are you joining him? Then they really didn't decide not to. Um, but later Vikings actually were very widely traveled, and so um, in the West they sailed all the way around Spain and raided up into into France and Italy and things like that. And likewise, the Eastern Vikings sailed all the way across. Um, uh, uh, Russia and into would go and visit actually visited Constantinople um, from the 10th century on in fact actually the Vikings routinely took service in the Byzantine Emperor's personal elite guard which is called the Varangian guard the Viking guard um, and so those guys would have been able to see um, some things that are pretty impressive if you went to Constantinople and you were to see Hagia Sophia just this what's still one of the most impressive buildings that's ever been <laughs> constructed um, and you'd see just the immense uh, wealth and power and just the idea that people could make something like that um, would have been pretty impressive to anybody showing up. So on the one hand, there is um, something that's backing it up. It's not like in the Vikings show where the Romans are somehow different from uh, uh, from from Charlemagne and, and, the, and the Byzantines. The Romans are the Byzantines for sure, and Charlemagne too. Um, there's also the need to keep up with the Joneses, as it were. <laughs> so these guys have a lot of cool stuff. So there's no doubt that um, uh, even though um, there was some asymmetrical power that Viking raiders had vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, their warfare, nevertheless, when they would see what, what some of these Anglo-Saxon and especially, let's say, the Frankish kings or uh, the Byzantine emperor had, it turns out those kings have a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> And the Vikings are kind of like, well, maybe I could be, you know, like, uh, instead of being a war chief, I could be, you know, a king with all this kind of wealth. And so as they became accustomed to kind of the wealth 
of the royal and noble classes of Christendom, they found that they kind of liked those luxuries um, um, better than they maybe liked the hardships of living Viking life. And so, in fact, the Danish court kind of quickly began to emulate uh, the Frankish court. So the Danes are the closest to anybody uh, to the to Christendom, and they kind of adopt some of these um, courtly ways, you know, luxurious ways there. It's, it's easy once somebody has something fancy that you want to have that too. Um, it's also true that two, you know, kind of were playing this um, supernatural game. What ends up happening in, sh it's a very weird thing in modern shows in the, like the Vikings, or actually there's several examples um, where, because I guess of fantasy movies, so the, so in, in, um, in Game of Thrones or in, in, in Lord of the Rings, this is a supernatural world or a fantasy world where there's magic and, and so the powers of the gods and everything like that work. But for some reason in shows like the Vikings, when the pagans do their various pagan rituals and things like that, they often work and have magic things, which is, very, you know, which is strange, <laughs> you know, because it's like saying, well, there was some kind of supernatural thing and the, the Viking gods were really real, but the Christians, God is not real, and so therefore they didn't have the magic. It's, it doesn't really make any sense. In both in both cases, whether you believe in supernatural stuff or not, and, and I'm not suggesting there's supernatural stuff going on, but people definitely believed in, in the supernatural, and they were both uh, experiencing it on both sides. And so, um, so for example, uh, a Christian hermit uh, predicted to uh, one of the Viking kings, Olaf Tryggvason, said if you know he as a prophet he came and said if you baptize you will win great victories and so that stuck into Olaf's head and he tried it out and then he had all these victories <laughs> and so he attributed those victories uh, to Christ and so he then forcibly converted much of Norway in the 990s um, and as a result of that uh, very strong conversion by the sword kind of tactics that he or the axe he's got in his picture here he is now um, known as saint olaf um, for his uh, saintly way of converting everybody <laughs> um, and then also what ends up happening then from these various like war bands as i was talking about um, where the kings don't really have much apparatus other than their in, their immediate you know, um, warriors around them and household. Now um, be they are able to draw upon um, the bureaucracy or the models of the bureaucracy that exists in the Frankish kingdoms and things like that in order to develop, you know, real kingdoms. And so evolving then from the uh, bureaucratic apparatus of the church as the church comes in, um, you know, what ends up happening is the church in Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in Francia the ch church actually really promotes monarchy. The bishops don't like warriors running around, you know, praying on land and and uh, uh, and robbing monasteries and stuff. They're pretty they're pretty keen actually on having a big strong king, and they we are very happy to equate the king and, and and make it pretty clear the king is like God on earth. So as we're thinking and praying to God, you can think of this little God that we have here, and the and the and the Roman church, the bishops are are pretty overtly doing that. So the kingdoms of Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, they develop then in tandem with the conversion of Norse kings because now these kings who are becoming Christian are have access to this kind of church uh, Roman apparatus um, that helps to allow them to actually develop a kingdom and, and create it. So the church brings the institutional apparatus needed to govern large states. There is an exception to this, <laughs> and it's a fun one. So uh, an exception is around uh, whatever around the year 1000, uh, Iceland, which is kind of a um, doesn't have a king. It's it's ruled by um, essentially a, a kind of a proto parliament, the All Thing, and the um, people come before the All Thing with the proposition uh, of whether Iceland should convert to Christianity, and they actually uh, actually do it by vote. And so it's a um, rare example of a democracy voting to convert uh, from paganism to Christianity. All right, so as a result, okay, a lot of um, uh, converting kings, you know, guys like St. Olaf in Norway, they burned um, pagan sorcerers as they thought of them, and they cut down all the sacred trees. Um, in most of the converted nations, then the old gods were called demons and stuff in league with Satan by the Christians. However, fortunately, because we have that um, 
uh, more peaceful conversion in Iceland, um, the gods then in Iceland were kind of remade into ancient heroes, and so their myths are preserved as sagas, and so they kind of Christianize, but still remembering a lot of their pagan roots. Uh, uh, Vikings of Iceland poets later wrote down all of these sagas, and so we have more of the kind of Norse myths and things like that uh, preserved than we do, for example, even in most cases of like the Germanic myths. And so and that's that's why you know for better or for worse um you know the norse gods and things like that are still going on um so while some of the anglo-saxon myths the german gods have been forgotten we still have uh thor and his peers who are still living on um and we're still having shows like the vikings for better and for worse i will mention i'm not going to only diss on hollywood here there's another show that's been going on about the same time that's also about the same period the viking period and the anglo-saxons it's called the last kingdom and so it's about uh the kingdom of of wessex and this one actually although it's again not not great history but it's it gets the history way more right than the history channel's vikings and so that is my take on pagan vikings versus the christians and why Christianity um, eked it out and actually uh, ended up converting uh, the Vikings in the long run. So hopefully you found that interesting and maybe there will be some questions. And so um, if there are questions, I invite you to um, type them in and we'll see if uh, we can start getting some of them. Okay, well, we'll give people a minute or two uh, to do the questions. <laughs> Well, one of the things, you know, again, um, I emphasized it only at the beginning, but one of the things, you know, as we also point out, is that there was initially a, um, um, a technological increase in terms of the, uh, the boats that the Vikings had. Those were eventually able to be built by everybody else, too. And meanwhile, it's further advances like castles and things like that that also um, would have made that, you know, whether you're Christian or not, it wasn't just that becoming Christian meant that uh, the Scandinavians weren't, weren't warlike anymore. I mean, obviously the Anglo-Saxons and the Franks, even though they are, um, uh, you know, even though the, even though they are Christians are also, also warriors. And so we'll actually even see how, um, almost immediately the next chapter of this is next week's when we're going to talk about the, um, about the Crusades, right? Because this is the early medieval people or the central middle ages people, um, as Europe is now on this upswing. Um, responding uh, to uh, developments in the Middle East. Okay. So, Roan Wagner asks, maybe Christianity simplified Norse life. Um, and so I, I think that that's actually true, although that would have been slow coming, right? So as I'm talking to you about like all of those things that you have to do, um, you know, as a pagan, um, so for people at the court, they might have, um, they might have had direct contact with the bishops and the bishops could have given them, uh, and priests could have given them solace about why they don't have to cross their fingers anymore or whatever it is that are these kind of, um, rituals that everybody else has to do. I would think that they're for, for locally, um, those kind of superstitions last a lot longer or those kind of practices. So the old practices will probably be carried on even if they stop talking about Freya and they start talking about the Virgin Mary, they stop talking about Thor uh, and they start talking about uh, St. George or something like that. And so, and so in other words, I think that um, there's a slow displacing of those things. So it wouldn't have been an immediate change because I think that um, some of those concerns would have still kept been kept up for a while, but ultimately it does. Um, Neil Douglas, what kept Muslim influence out of the North? Um, well, so there wouldn't have been that, so the Muslims um, weren't very close at all to Scandinavia. So there was a lot, there was a big buffer between um, the Muslims realm and the far North here um, in terms of um, what cupped the Muslims out of um, 
anyway, the middle area, the Frankish, the Latin West. Uh, essentially, the Muslims have made it all the way up into this time period. They make it all the way up to, they take over Sicily. Uh, they have most of Spain. And then they have little bases in, in Italy and, um, and in France even. And they raid from there. So they're raiding um, Christian Christendom at the same time the Vikings are. It's a different kind of raid though because the the um, the Vikings are raiding up, so they're taking stuff that they can't really make, and they're excited and they take wealth back with them. The Muslims are raiding down. They are in a more advanced society, and they're primarily at a certain point just taking people. So they're just raiding to get slaves uh, because there's not enough wealth in the West, um, the Latin West, for you know anyway for those societies, and so they don't take it. There's there's concerted efforts to stop them, so they're. Um, couple the Frankish emperors especially are, are um, organized to stop intrusions um, and that and they also just don't care enough they've got other fish to fry and so uh, Constantinople also stops them they just can't take it I mean the walls of Constantinople are amazing the underberg is it safe to say that since I have Norwegian and Swedish ancestors that they were Norseman Vikings. I think it's very safe to say that you will have had ancestors who were actually went Vikings. So so Viking is, is a Western, as the uh, term that we use, it, uh, it it actually isn't what people would have necessarily called it. You're going a Viking, it's like a, it's a, um, it's kind of means like raider. And so um, the people, when they come home, they're, they're landowners, they're jarls, they're, they're, they're farmers and things like that when they would come home. Um, but in any event, one of the things that happens, Leon, is that if you, um, people are more descended from the nobility, you know, there's like some huge percentage of um, people in Asia are descended from Genghis Khan because um, the nobles are more likely to uh, reproduce and have lots of kids and have multiple wives and have, um, and have uh, their kids are more likely to live and be wealthy and be able to reproduce and all that kind of thing. And so as a result, um, you're probably very likely to have Viking ancestors. Yes, almost certainly. Um, Rowan Wagner, were Germanic gods similar to Norse gods? So they have the same names almost. And so we assume that they are coming from the same proto-Germanic and in some cases even Indo-European um, sources. Um, and and some of the some of the stories are similar. Uh, and so, and so there are some cases, if they go all the way back, you know, yes, there's a shared origin. In some cases, uh, they will have had a more recent development that will have happened after the two cultures diverged. And so a lot of the things that we will have heard about, like the development of Odin and having the, um, the one eye or all the different stories that are told maybe about him, those may not have been true for Woden, um, um, but some of them would be. So, so yes, there's, there's overlap, there's similarities. Uh, Corey Bell, what was uh, the Viking relationships to the Laps, or did they not exist at that time? So I think there were Laps. Um, so the relationship always is, is that uh, the Laps are people that live even further north, and um, and they are uh, poorer and more primitive, and they would have been. Um, I mean, if they have much relationship at all, it would be a trading relationship, a warring relationship. Um, in some cases, maybe the Vikings are also um, raiding and capturing laps to be slaves. Probably there's just the laps are too poor for them to, to worry about. But essentially, those are people that live even further north um, and who are eking out a uh, survival in the same way, for example, that the, um, that the Inuit are able to do that in North America. And so um, um, I, they're not... They're not they're not related in terms of their languages, I don't think, and um, and so they wouldn't necessarily they would have influenced each other, but they would have been a separate sphere of people. Yeah, lap laps probably known as the Sami. So um, uh, Eunice Strangways. Uh, so free trade was really stealing or looting from each other. <laughs> well, so there wasn't much free trade back then. So trade in the Middle Ages and antiquity would have always been accompanied by large numbers of tariffs. And so there would have been tariffs and duties everywhere. And so trade wasn't free. Um, and what, what it is is that and Vikings, we call them Vikings or whatever, when they show up at a, a rich port that is well guarded and well fortified and there's a whole bunch of armies there, then they whatever they brought to trade, they trade. And that's suddenly they're traders. If they show up at a 
kind of an isolated, defenseless monastery, and nobody's there, then they're then they're raiders. Uh, and so those there's a massive overlap um, throughout, frankly, ancient times as well between pirates and merchants. Um, and so sometimes people are more professionally just pirates, um, and sometimes they're more merchants, and sometimes they do both uh, with depending on who they who they meet. And so um, so yeah, so it was there was definitely um, an aspect of opportunism when you're already far from home anyway in an extraordinarily dangerous environment um, and so if you have the opportunity if you if in some ways a trading relationship can be more lucrative if it if it actually if you can actually repeat it one of the problems with a rating relationship is nobody trusts you after you do it right so okay uh, why Ken Robertson asks why did the German and Anglo-Saxon traditions not continue to be talked about or told so um yeah so so they they did a little bit i mean so we have some and so for example um i mean you're probably aware in the anglo-saxon tradition of the um you know of the epic of beowulf which is uh, written in anglo-saxon and so even though it's talking about scandinavian realms um it's nevertheless an anglo-saxon um epic and tradition and there are other Anglo-Saxon uh, things preserved in the Anglo-Saxon language, and there are some um, descriptions of Germanic religion in Latin and Roman annals. Um, you know, not everybody, so, so most things aren't preserved. So somebody has to decide to preserve something. And so for the Icelandic people, um, we just have to be very... Um, happy with them and loved the fact that these guys were poets and they loved their sagas and that they wrote them all down you know they told them all they wrote them all down um, nobody that that similar tradition just didn't exist for unfortunately the Germanic and Anglo-Saxon stuff um, who when they when they when they got a hold of writing um, they were interested in other things you know and so they were writing Latin about about stuff that wasn't about paganism and so we didn't get it didn't get recorded unfortunately uh leon asks uh was there ever a chance that norse religion would have conquered christian europe and um so i would say no the chance is zero zero because even um you know even even with the actual conquest of um of the whole roman empire by by uh germanic tribes i mean the germanic tribes had already mostly converted to a kind of they were lukewarm converts mostly um, to a kind of uh, Christianity, with the exception of the Franks, they were all um, Aryan Christians, um, and then the Lombards actually might have been a little pagan by the time they even showed up. They were um, a little uh, fresher off the boat, as it were, in terms of Germanic confederations. And yet, I think that there was the 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 system doesn't exist. Um, it doesn't for for that those religions to have um, a state. Uh, to be able to run state apparatus, so they just wouldn't. Have, they don't have it in them. They wouldn't have had it in them to be able to run the bureaucracies that and everything else that you would have needed um, to run a state like that. Um, the one chance that there was that we could have that there would have been a um, a pagan West, and we could have had a West. It wouldn't be pagan. We wouldn't call it paganism, but it, it would have been a a possibility of uh, the old gods of Greece and Rome surviving. Uh, much like Hinduism. So Hinduism isn't paganism anymore either, but it has the same gods of the Hindu pagan past, and it's become a world religion because of um, its contact with other great world religions, Buddhism especially, and, and Islam, which caused it to galvanize and become kind of what it is. But it maintained the old gods back to a time when we would have called call them essentially the pagan gods of ancient India. Likewise, Zeus and Jupiter and whatever, the, the the pagan gods of the Rome, Greco-Roman world might have survived if um, uh, Julian the Apostate had survived. So Charlemagne, I'm not sure, Constantine's um, uh, this heir, you know, Julian, who um, reverted uh, the empire to uh, pagan and tried to create a pagan church uh, with the old gods and everything like that. Um, if he hadn't, if he hadn't been killed. Uh, uh, in, in a battle with the Persians, if he had um, been able to last a long 50-year reign, he might have been able to create this thing before Christianity had taken hold. And so then we would have had a very different um, 
Western future. Um, and then on the other hand, the paganism that would have emerged would have been almost identical to uh, Roman Christianity anyway, but it would have had different it would have had different mythology and different rituals and things like that. Okay. Um, Ron Wagner asked, are Finns considered Norse? Um, so no, um, they are considered Scandinavians. Um, uh, and so they're one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, but Finland is actually um, a completely different um, early language and cultural group. And so they're part of the, the Finno-Ugric language group and they're related to Hungarians and Karelians and, and Estonians. Um, and so uh, they have had, though, a long, long, long history uh, with the Norse, with the specifically the Swedes, including being colonized by them for a whole long time. And so there is a cultural uh, relationship that exists now. And so, but they would have been a different. They would have been different at the time. Actually, one of the weird things that happened is that um, the Finns and Finnic peoples were on the edge of the uh, the Mongol Empire, and some of them became. Um, Mongolized, and that's how they became kind of um, steppe peoples, you know, who were like uh, the, like the Mongols or the Huns, and that's how they moved to Hungary, right, and became the Hungarians. Uh, so there's an interesting histories with the Finns. Anyway, so that's lots of great questions. So I'm glad that this um, piqued a lot of ideas in all of you, and uh, hopefully you found that interesting. And uh, so we'll tune in next week, and we're going to talk about um, medieval Christians and medieval Muslims, their ideas of holy war and indeed the, the holy wars that they, they fought against each other. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll talk to you next week.